So, and let me please introduce Dean Arun Majumdar from the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for taking some time. Arun, you are the busiest bee, and yet you are here with us for a, a full hour. And we'll get a little bit of discussion going, but we'll save plenty of time for your questions. Okay, and, um, but we'll start with a few opening remarks maybe um, that I'd like to ask you an open-ended question. And you have to understand there is an exam at the end of this. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, so <laughs> some of them are ready for that. Okay, I can do this. <laughs> so, uh, so Arun, sustainability. Uh, it gets talked about all the time. There's, there's not a, a day goes by that folks don't hear about it. Uh, here, Stanford's created a school of sustainability. And um, uh, how, how to help uh, our me to we alums, our, our lead alums, in thinking about making sense of all of these big issues we hear about under the umbrella of sustainability? First of all, Bill, if I could spend an hour with you any time of the week, I'll take it. So thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks very much. Um, thank you for inviting me, and welcome back uh, to all of you. I hear that this is a grassroots organization that has very come much. together, um, and you like to get together every year, which is fantastic. Um, you know, if I look at the where the world is today, there are multiple, and I call this both stresses, but also opportunities. Um, the world population is going up. Right now it's 8 billion, and it's going to go up to 10 or 11 billion by the end of the century. And if you look at the trajectory of the population, it's gone up like this. It's only the last 100 years that the population has gone up. The world has never seen anything like this before, and so many human beings at the same time. I call this the human tsunami. Mm. Um, then there is the, and in the business school, you'll know this, uh, um, the consumption. Um, and Arun, can I interject a question sure. there for folks who, who are still <laughs> contemplating the human tsunami? Are we likely to level off? Yeah, we're likely to level off by the middle of this century at about 10 billion, then by the end of the century, it's going to be 11 billion, and we may have a population decline. Okay. And it all really depends on the fertility of women in Africa. Uh, that's where the most of the population growth is going to be. But just to give you some numbers, it took a million years for the world population to grow up to 300 million, right? And it takes 13 years to add a billion now. Okay, so it, it, it's literally like this. It's not an exponential. It's a super, ultra, super exponential. Then the consumption, I mean, if you look at the GDP growth, and this is a good thing. Our quality of life is completely different from what our ancestors, even my grandparents, what they lived in, which was largely, and if you look at the great-grandparents, largely an agrarian society. This is completely different. Yeah, yeah. And to power all that, you have, you need energy, and energy, 80%, 80 plus percent fossil fuel, I mean, to have a CO2 tsunami, or you can now look, think about the water consumption, the water tsunami, the food, all of that are now going through this trajectory of an ex super exponential growth, right? And then climate change on top of that is, put stresses on everything, it aggravates the problem. So you have this thing where you, we are in energy transition, but the energy transition um, will affect the water. Mm -hmm. Water will affect food. Mm -hmm. Food will affect biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Biodiversity will affect conservation in ecosystems, mm -hmm. ecology. That will affect public health. Mm -hmm. And climate change affects all of them. So that's the compounded problem. This is compound interest. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so now, how do we address this in a way that is holistic and comprehensive? Because if you address each one of them separately, which is the normal tendency, right? Let's solve the energy problem. 
but that could affect something else and you end up potentially in this unintended consequences. And we are living in the unintended consequences of the 20th century. So we definitely want to avoid that. So I think one has to look at these times as a, um, as a times of major change and which will have implications on society worldwide. And I like to, you know, one of my must read books that I give to everyone is someone who actually taught briefly at GSB um, is a legendary CEO in the Bay Area who passed away recently is Andy Grove. Mm -hmm. Andy yeah. Grove wrote the book, Only the Paranoid Survive. And if you have not read this book, especially gone through business, I would you know, urge you to read it because he points out, I mean, he was obviously in the semiconductor business, but he points out that there are times when a company or a business or an industry or the world goes through an inflection point where the fundamentals have just changed. And when the fundamentals change, you're in a different world. And going back and collecting data to plan out the future is not an effective strategy. Yeah, yeah. Um, you have to think differently. You have to connect the dots. You've got to try out some experiments. I think the world is in that stage right now where you're seeing you know, snippets here and there. If you connect the dots, we are at an inflection point. And, um, and we need to think holistically, think differently than what we had uh, done before. You know, th this is incredibly exciting because if you, you know, when I hear you talk, Arun, the past inflection points, yeah, without getting all into deep history, but if you think about the mechanization revolution in the 1800s, early 1900s, when you think of the digitization revolution that we've, we're just emerging from, those both hit as a, as a shock to the world system. We see the sustainability revolution coming. And um, maybe we could divert for a minute and, and talk a little about what, what you've been up to and, and, the, and, and the other leadership here at Stanford to create a sustainability school. And, um, and I bring this up because I think for most folks, when you hear about these big changes, you right away think, well, all right, well, what are you doing about this? Well, this is, I mean, the history goes, this is how I got to work with Bill. Um, when the former president and provost came in, just 2016, yeah. in 2017, you know, they led an effort called a long-range planning effort, which is essentially a grassroots effort to understand what do Stanford faculty, students, alums, and all want to see happen at Stanford, right? And there were like 5,000 white papers that came up. And issues like that like we're talking about came together and they were put under the umbrella of sustainability, climate and sustainability. And then we were asked to be in a committee um, on, and we were given one quarter to propose to the president and provost, how should Stanford be organized uh, for the future to address this issue? And I thought there'll be like half a year effort. He said, no, no, you got one quarter to deliver. Well, you chaired this. Which committee. we did. Yeah, <laughs> Which you, we did. you chaired this committee, if I remember. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> Which we did. And we went around speaking to every faculty, student group, and we, we said we will leave no stone unturned or unthrown at us. <laughs> and, and we had a few stones yeah, they thrown were at us. <laughs> but we, we really sort of took the, uh, what people wanted to see. And then we proposed two structures because we told everyone that if you have only one organizational structure, the president and provost has no choice. And so we proposed two and they picked a school. And, and that's how the school got, then there was a whole effort in trying to put the meat on the skeleton. And then the school was launched two, you know, two years ago, mm -hmm. um, in September of 22. And with, a, with the largest gift that Stanford has ever received. And we thank the donors um, for providing that really the uh, the bench to the foundation to get us started. So that's how it all happened. But it is a, it's a different kind of school because as you can well imagine, this is not just an engineering issue or a business issue or a legal issue. It is all of the above. Yeah. So this is really, an, in many ways, we have been given the responsibility and, 
you know, um, we have just launched the Department of Environmental Social Sciences. Bill is the department chair. And, and, you know, and if you look at the composition of just that department, it brings people from all parts of campus. So it is a, I almost think of us, Stanford, giving us the role and the responsibility of being stewards on behalf of all Stanford campus to harness the intellectual horsepower of our faculty, students, and staff and direct them, whoever wants to, direct them towards the issues related to sustainability. And I call this both challenges. There are challenges. There are opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's how the school got formed. That's a great background. So uh, everybody knows what a school entails, right? It's got, uh, we're going to have students. We have undergraduates. Uh, you teach the undergraduates, uh, uh, master's students, PhD students. Um, I can imagine if I'm in your shoes, you're thinking, well, so you're going to study it. You're going to teach about it. Sustainability is different. We've got to do something about it. What is the school doing to address impact? Yeah, so we have, um, it's a great question. We, in fact, when we had this no stone unturned or unthrown, we went around the campus. Everyone told us, almost unanimously, which is rare in academic institution, <laughs> unanimity. Um, everyone almost told us that we got to find solutions. And we have to think about scale from the beginning. Yeah. I call it the giga problem. You got giga people, right? Eight billion going to 10. You got giga tons of CO2 that we're dealing with or methane. And you got other giga water. You can, this is a giga problem. And if, if you don't think about scale from the early, from the early days or the uh, early stages, we may miss the boat. We may be stuck at mega. And that's not going to cut it. So we have a unit in our school called the accelerator. And the whole job of the accelerator is to launch solutions, is to take the research that we have, translate that in some way, think about scale from the beginning, filtering out things that are unlikely to scale, and only focus on things that are likely to scale and get them out of Stanford. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, this is not a perfect analogy, and uh, uh, you know, I, I dread to even say it, but nevertheless, there's a history out here it's almost like Fred Turman nurturing two of his students, Hewlett and Packard, and getting them launched, which was the birth of Silicon Valley. Um, this is a different, of course. Here we have global issues that we're dealing with, but we've got to think about scale and think differently from how they thought about it at that time. Well, what's an example of, of the kinds of things that, that are coming out of the accelerator? Right, so um, the way we're looking at it is, there are some big problems that if you don't solve them, we are unlikely to address climate change and sustainability. One of them, and so we call them flagships. It's almost like President Kennedy in 1962 going to Rice University saying, we shall go to the moon, return safely within this decade, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And what they did at that time was to put a flag on and imagine that solution and then work backwards to see what do they need to do. They need to build a rocket, they need to build a navigation system, space, all of that. So we are taking a leaf from that success story and said, what are the big things that we have to do? So the first one that we went out with is greenhouse gas removal from the atmosphere at the gigaton per year scale at less than $100 a ton, right? Now we know all the analysis has shown that if you don't remove the CO2 from the atmosphere, um, we are unlikely to solve, uh, address climate change, two degrees, forget about 1.5, 1.5 is even more aggressive, but two degrees global average temperature rise, we've got to remove. Because the lifetime of CO2 molecules in the atmosphere is a few hundred years. So all the CO2 that was emitted from James Watt's engine and the steam engine and all, using coal, they're still there. And so we have put that garbage out there, and we've got to remove it, so that other nations that are in the early days of development can actually grow, right? 
And so uh, it's imperative that we do that. And so that's a big flagship. But it has to be at the gigaton per year scale. And then you work backwards from that and see what are the different challenges that some of the science problems that we often look at very favorably in our labs, they may not actually scale. So filtering that out is a really important challenge because you know, I like to say academia is let, the, or let you know, a thousand flowers bloom, which is how academia normally operates. Here we're saying, let's define the garden where it can bloom because it is much more effective and efficient. And so we are doing that. And, but along this journey beyond Stanford, there are lots of things. It's not just science and engineering, economics, how much is going to cost? How much headroom do you have to reduce the cost? Are there supply chain issues? Are there infrastructure challenges? Are there policy levers, regulatory barriers, public acceptance, markets? All of that has to be put together in understanding so that when we launch a solution, whether it's a commercial startup company or, or an NGO for that matter, that they have thought about this journey ahead of time. So the principles of scaling is something that we will absolutely focus, not only as an educational approach, but to put that in practice in the accelerator. Yes, yes. You know, it's, it's interesting, you know, when you, when you hear you talk, Arun, you move so easily between talking about the, the technical aspects of, of what we have to do. Uh, just so you know, Arun is actually separate from being a leader in, in, uh, here at Stanford and uh, previous to that in Washington, the Department of Energy, as uh, the National Academy of Sciences scholar. So that's uh, a strong suit for you, obviously, am among the world experts in that, but also talking about the behavioral aspects, policy, policy levers. Yesterday, I heard you speaking through a third lens, and that was the lens of uh, morals and ethics uh, of environmental justice. Um, and, uh, you know, our me to we crowd are folks from all over the world. And in, in many of the parts of the world where, where our uh, folks are coming from, there are, there are people who are already uh, suffering from the consequences of climate change, and we're early in, in the century yet. What's your, what's your stand and what's the school doing on the environmental justice front? Yeah, so you know, I was born and brought up in India, which is global south. Um, went to college out there, came for grad school out here. That's been my trajectory. So you know, the world is not flat. You know, the world is flat as far as technology is concerned. Right? Solar panel out here and solar panel in China, roughly the same cost and performance, right? But the world is not flat of, as to how the development has progressed, the population density, um, the impact of climate uh, in, the, in this temperate world will be much lower compared to the global south, mm. where heat and humidity waves are likely to be, I mean, unbearable. It's already unbearable. I think, you know, we just hope that people don't die from the heat and humidity waves in the future. Um, and so it, it is pretty uneven. And I always say this, that different countries are starting from a, in this transition, even the energy transition, leave alone water or other things, they're starting from a different initial condition. Mm -hmm. And they, they have different boundary conditions, different constraints. So how they navigate this transition is going to be different. And we have to accept that. Solutions that work out here do not work over there, yeah. not, may not work over there. So this understanding that the transition is going to be different and accepting that and making sure that the transition is just, yeah. that it, it, it is accepted by the local people, super important. Yeah. Yeah. Because it is true that the impacts of climate and the weather extreme that it creates are likely to affect the people in different parts of the world differently. And they may be an income level distribution out here. You know, if you look at a place like India, only 8% of the population of 1.5 billion have access to air conditioning. 8%, 92% don't. So how do we address that? That's a completely different problem out, than out here. 
so I, I think that's so the idea of looking at it from a, as you in your course and you know, so Bill teaches a course called College 106 and and you look at things from a three different angles: ethics lens, mm -hmm. te technical lens, mm -hmm. and uh, behavioral, behavioral lens. lens yeah. Right? That is so important because those lenses are needed to understand what the problems. And our job is to is to really work with the people around the world to see how we can co-develop solutions so that we understand what they're. So I think that lens is super important. And I always say this: that if you if you want to address if addressing climate change does not improve the quality of life of people around the world, we're not going to be able to address climate change. Yes, yes, yeah. But what I'd like to, to ask before we turn to um, everyone, Arun, is how can folks engage with the School of Sustainability? I get notes uh, from, from you all. They know a video version of me. Uh, uh, and, He's and in so, 3D, and so, just so you know. He so, looks great in 3D, but so well, I had a beard, so a lot of them do a double take now. But it, it uh, the uh, the COVID uh, beard, you know. But uh, uh, a lot of a lot, I get a lot of notes from them asking how they can how they can engage because uh, this isn't something that only people deal with if they're specializing in sustainability, right? Folks all over the world. Uh, can do their part? Well, I mean, so we have multiple, you know, opportunities. I'm, I'm looking at Dave Weinstein out here and, and, and Jennifer Gardner. Dave ran the Stanford Executive Program for about 10 years and now has joined the Door School. Um, and we are in partnership with GSB and many other School of Engineering, SCPD it's, as well. And there's an element of education. We are an educational institution. You have come here in the past for education. Um, and I, I think there's a, there's a need for education, and as Dave likes to call it, education and mobilization. Because we need to get people moving in this direction, to be at least aware of some of the opportunities and challenges that people are likely to face. So I would direct you to Dave. <laughs> so that's one. Um, we are also in the accelerator. We think that, you know, first of all, we have to accept that we don't have monopoly on talent out here. The talent is worldwide. And the opportunities are not uniform. And so one of the things that we are thinking of in the accelerator is to open up some programs to recruit talent for some time, work with our faculty and students, and help launch solutions. Now think of that as a EIR, or Entrepreneur in Residence program. And right now, if you go to Sandal Road, all well, the VCs, they have EIRs. And the EIRs generally go from technology, and they sold something, and they stay there for a little while looking for the next gig, right? But they remain in technology, biotech to biotech. But there are many people who want to spend some time in pivoting their career. And, 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 and where do you go to get educated? Where do you go to connect with the right people? At the end of the day, at the end of the day it's all about the people mm -hmm. and the ideas. And so we are thinking of this as a way to bring in talent, have them pivot, form the team, and, and nurture those ideas and get them launched. So those are some of the ways that we can do. Um, we are thinking of a next year sort of a, opening up a master's program. The master's program right now is internal. It's called the Cotram program. But we are thinking of open, opening that up to other outsiders as well. So this is still in play right now. One of the opportunities uh, that I see for our students um, is the following. First of all, the amount of interest that I see amongst the students is phenomenal. And, and I want to tap into that energy right now because students realize then our next generation realize that their future uh, depends on what we're trying to do in sustainability. And so one of my goals is to give the opportunity for every Stanford student, not necessarily in our school. As I said, this is an all-campus effort. Every Stanford student, the opportunity to do an internship 
outside Stanford. And it could be here locally. It could be anywhere in the world. And, um, and the reason being that we want our students to understand what the real challenges are out there. And in doing so, and in engaging with people around the world, they'll get to learn not only the challenges, they'll get to learn people, the culture, the, the social issues. Because if you are to address this problem, the human angle to this is super important. You know, scale, when you're talking about greenhouse gases, we have to think about scale. On the other hand, when we think about community issues, if you think about scale, you'll miss the boat. So you have to think local, because community is local. So here's the dilemma, is that how do you solve problems that are community-based at the local level and be able to scale, right? And this is what Dave uh, Weinstein is, you should connect with him, is looking at is that, is there a model for scaling things that are local? And I mean, a great example is the internet. The internet allows you to connect with people. The internet doesn't give you solutions. The solutions are still from people to people, right? And so the concept of that, where you don't create the solution for communities, but you create a platform for some community members to provide solutions to other community members, understanding the community is something that we are looking at. Because that will allow a platform for scalability as opposed to solving community by community problems, which is really, you know, really difficult. So we, are, we don't have a nuclear engineering department. Um, there's a lot of discussion nuclear happens at the policy level at Hoover. Um, and I'm involved in that a little bit. Um, nuclear is, is um, in the United States, you know, the, all the nuclear that we are now looking at, the new nuclear or even the relicensing of the nuclear plants, are, it's, it's really, I mean, it's, there's no new technology. It's really a business model problem that we are having. Because, because of the integration of renewables and gas, the price of electricity has gone down at the wholesale level, not at the retail level. And the margins for nuclear have gone down. So nuclear cannot survive on a day-to-day -day basis or month-to-year-to-year -year -to -year basis. So now the Inflation Reduction Act and the infrastructure bill um, uh, has provided some payments to the nuclear to keep them going so that you know, shutting down existing nuclear plants, given its you know, contributions to carbon-free power, we should not be shutting them down. So this is really to sustain current nuclear. The new nuclear is a different ball game, because that's small modular nuclear. And, and small modular for a variety of reasons. I won't go for actually the biggest reasons, financing. Um, but that needs a, enough of a market initially to bring down the cost of new nuclear, uh, small modular, to be able to become you know, competitive without any subsidies. So that's in play right now. I mean, I'm happy to go into, I mean, this is what I, I've been doing for a while, so I have to go into more details, but uh, that's the opportunity. Most of the new, new nuclear is being built in China, 28 nuclear plants being built in China. These are still the AP1000 gigawatt scale. The small modular, I think, is the future, and that's still, I mean, Canada, Ontario Power has just acquired, bought one from GE. GE has gone into small modular as well. Uh, Arun, can you address safety with small modular nuclear? Yeah. So safety is, um, if you look at nuclear, sort of the whole value chain, um, the safety part, which is regulated in the United States by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is really the gold standard, um, along the value chain, it is one of the safest industries out there. Um, what we have had in the United States is Three Mile Island in 1981 or 82. Yeah, yeah. No one died, right? The gross things that have happened are Chernobyl and uh, Fukushima. Fukushima because of the, and I was in the Department of Energy when Fukushima actually happened. 
and uh, we realize that the nuclear is going to take, uh, it's, it'll be a delay of about a decade. It's been more than that now, right? So for nuclear to come back, uh, one needs to look at the data on safety. There's a public perception as well. The biggest challenge that we see in addition to the business model is the fuel cycle because the policy in the United States uh, is not clean. It's political. And our waste right now is not going to Nevada because people in Nevada don't like it. Uh, whereas a military waste is actually going to New Mexico. But anyway, so there's a long, long drawn answer to say that we need to clean up our act in our policy framework to manage nuclear waste. The waste today sits in the nuclear plant itself in big, you know, essentially bathtubs right now. I look at corporations with two different lenses. There are corporations that are doing the ESG as a compliance issue, right? And there are businesses that are looking at this climate change and sustainability and energy as an opportunity, as a business opportunity. I would certainly look at that, the second group, as a way to look at employment or jobs or where you want to be. Because yes, there's a compliance issue. SEC may require disclosures of some kind and you have to comply by it. If SEC does that, you'll have to comply. But then you can also think of it as a way that you are the cusp of multiple industries that are likely to grow, each of them a few trillion dollars per year. I'll give you a few examples. Um, if you look at the semiconductor industry, is a two or three trillion dollars a year. The auto industry is about three or four trillion dollars a year, right? These are, these are massive industries. If you are to integrate renewables on the grid, because renewables is the cheapest way to store electricity or produce electricity, you need storage. Storage needs to be at the terawatt hour scale. That's a trillion dollar industry that we are in the early days of starting. If you are to address climate change and if there is a price on carbon or SEC requires disclosure or if the 80% of the Fortune 500 companies that have made climate commitments of net zero and all the major nations have made climate commitments net zero, net means that you got to take CO2 out. If you're going to do it at a gigaton per year scale, right, and it's $100 a ton, that's a trillion dollar industry that does not exist today. So you can go down the line of each of these industries. In fact, you could think of this as a way, in a way that you have multiple industries that yet to be started, that are in the early days right now, simultaneously starting, each of them a trillion dollar industry. Now, that's an opportunity that I wish I was an undergraduate student right now that I could lean into. You know, when we talk in your courses about disruption. We use examples from the past, but your answer makes me think there's a disruption going on now that 21st century businesses are seeing sustainability as an opportunity as opposed to just a compliance issue. So we should all reflect on that, on that in terms of our own organizations. Uh, and it really depends on the leadership. Look at the leadership of corporations and how they're thinking. I'll give you one example we're dealing with right now is the global company but headquartered in India, Tata. You talk to the Tata chairman, you will leave inspired that this is an opportunity, mm -hmm. right? They're getting into battery storage because the auto industry is, is a tectonic shift in the auto industry. They're gonna to put together some battery manufacturing in India and they're figuring out, are they gonna leapfrog? Are they gonna play safe, right? So that's, you know, you, and you, you look at the Tata buses that are electric, they're going electric in two wheelers and three wheelers. It's a very different ball game out there than out here. That's just one example. They're looking at the steel industry and saying, how can we decarbonize? Because that's the future. So I think the leadership of these corporations will really matter. And he asked the question, which leaders are thinking of it as in compliance or which ones are looking at it as business opportunity for returns or investors? Look at technology in the context of a system, right? We have some major infrastructure and systems that, that way we need the new technologies to come in. One is the electricity system. 
we're not going to throw away the electricity system. In fact, that's going to grow. And then he asked the question, what's missing out there? What are the different opportunities? Well, clearly, the renewable integration is going to happen worldwide. That's already at scale. And then he asked the question, what do you need? Well, you need to be this. The grid was never designed for renewables. It was designed for turbo machinery. And the turbo machinery is to track the load. Um, and so now you've got fluctuating um, you know, generation. So you need, clearly need storage. You need power management. Um, there are opportunities in the current market structures uh, that you can do arbitrage. There's lots of businesses that some of them launched from Stanford that are actually doing that. So the electricity system and electrification of industry, electrification of homes is going to happen. It's already happening. And so I think that's an opportunity from a technology, from a context of a system. The other one is the fuel system. While we like to get our fossil fuel, it's not easy. 80% of our economy runs on fossil fuels. So how do you create a fuel at that scale that is emissions free and can leverage the existing infrastructure? Infra you have to realize infrastructure is very expensive and time consuming to build. So if you can develop technologies that can leverage existing infrastructure, you can move faster. That's speed. And so there are opportunities. Can we use natural gas, for example, in a carbon-free way to produce hydrogen without any emissions. And there's two companies that have come out of Stanford on pyrolysis. That is, you pyrolyze methane to produce hydrogen and solid carbon, and you can sell the solid carbon and subsidize hydrogen. And you're infrastructure compatible. So there are technologies like that in the fuel side. And then, as I said, I mean, we have to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, and there are many ways to do that. One, I, one of my favorites is to use agriculture. Agriculture, if you look at the crop waste by itself, just the waste that we throw away or burn, that absorbs about 10 gigatons of CO2 per year. And that's a target in 2050. We're doing it every year. We don't do anything with it. So can you take that, that waste product, actually pay the farmers, and get carbon credits and do something with it, right? So there are all these opportunities, and I could go on and on. I don't want to bore you with the details, but there are all these opportunities out there that you could, if you really think about systemically and you identify gaps and opportunities, that's, those are the opportunities out there. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, the, the reality is that there's plenty of change that is happening quickly and there will be lots of organizations and, and lots of people uh, uh, who don't change. And when a disruption hits the world and this sustainability revolution is here, those who do change quickly become the new status quo. Um, and um, you know, I look at the, at the undergraduates here and I think there is the greatest generation. Uh, because by the time they are the status quo, we will see a very different world than we see today. Right? A world of renewable power, a world of uh, adapted food systems, a world where we uh, have much more uh, thoughtful use of water in our agriculture. The process of getting there is going to be incredibly difficult because not everyone will change immediately. And most forecasts are looking at a great deal of human misery and suffering and death along the way and that, and that suffering and death not being equally distributed. And that's just a reality. You know, saying that the next century will smoothly move to a new transition would be like saying in the year 1900 that we're going to have a peaceful century ahead. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that we didn't have peace in that century. It meant that the process of getting there was difficult 
and fraught with error and torture the way humans make things be, right? And so, you know, this disruption will happen. It is inevitable. And those who change will be the future. Those who don't change, the organizations and the people who don't change, they become part of history. The organizations die and people die too. If you look at philanthropy, first of all, philanthropy plays a very important role um, in this ecosystem because, as you pointed out, uh, traditional investing um, has not quite gone there. Um, and so we work with many philanthropic foundations, and what we are seeing is a transition. Again, these are early days even for philanthropy. Um, 80% of, and correct me if I'm wrong, 80% of the philanthropic uh, funding goes into medical, um, into health. And that ought to be the case, right? It is very important for all of us. But I think we are seeing right now with major funds, I'm associated with the Bezos Earth Fund, for example, $10 billion focused towards uh, in, uh, sustainability, climate, environment, et cetera. And there are others like that that are coming into the space and I think we are seeing that transition right now. They're hugely helpful. They can catalyze things that we universities cannot. They can, be, they can go into advocacy. Well, we cannot, right? We normally stay out of advocacy. We are about scholarship, about a research, um, looking at things objectively and taking it out there and then someone can run with it. We are about education. So I think we see a, a very healthy partnership um, with philanthropy and university, but I would also say that we should not, Stanford should not be the only one with a school of sustainability. It's like school of medicine. There should be so many of them worldwide so that we can partner. Because if Stanford or a few, you know, Columbia or a few universities are the only ones having it, I think we are missing the boat out here. So a, a big area of social research right now is, is to, is to try to separate the signal from the noise in, um, in messaging around sustainability. Think about everything that uh, Arun was just saying, the depth of knowledge that's required to really understand when a business is doing something that's making a difference. Most folks aren't going to have that level of knowledge. Uh, the, the issues can be very complex, and so, uh, we need to have measurement uh, and, uh, and measurement that makes it so that when people look at a company making a promise, they know whether that promise is real or whether that promise is, is merely greenwashing. And the, the evidence suggests that there's, a, there's been uh, uh, so much greenwashing that, e that at this point, even the price of carbon, the way it's currently priced in so-called voluntary markets, appears to reflect the marketing advantage from greenwashing rather than the actual social cost of, ca of uh, carbon. Uh, so the problem is real and, uh, and it needs to be addressed. I would say to learn more about it, there are folks in uh, accounting at, uh, at the business school uh, and in finance at the business school, as well as uh, folks in the new social science department who are looking at that. We've had some really interesting conferences on that, and those podcasts are available uh, for you to listen to. Uh, so you can shoot a note to me or, or any of the lead staff, and they can direct you to those. But uh, this is a big area for research, so that because if we can get measurement right on this, we can make people's buying decisions in the market more effective, and we can discipline companies to take more seriously the obligations that they publicly uh, commit to. So, yeah, I mean, if I could just add to that, um, the measurement is super important. The framework of life cycle analysis, um, mm -hmm. that is really important because it's not just the scope three emissions of the product. And actually, Apple is really good at that. Some of the people who are dealing with this are Stanford alums. Um, but also how you, uh, how the waste that comes out of it. And um, I think we, you know, there's a birth of a circular economy. There are lots of very interesting. We had right out here a few weeks back, um, J.B. Straubel, who is the CEO of 
Redwood Materials and the co-founder of Tesla, and Redwood Materials all will battery recycling. Well, I think there needs to be much more of that. So putting that framework of full life cycle so that you can avoid the greenwashing. But, you know, a little bit of greenwashing going on because we don't have the metrics. We don't have the framework. And that requires knowledge and understanding and development of creating new ways of looking at things.